Welcome to Deeper Revelation International School of Ministry. We are studying our glorious inheritance, the revelation of the names and the titles given to the children of God. A fantastic and illuminating subject that awakens within you this insight into who you are in God's great plan. And then once you apply it to your life, it becomes relevant and powerful as you become God's means of transforming the world around you. So we're going to finalize or finish up our study on the elect of God. We've done two sessions on what it is to be one of God's elect, and we're going to bring it to a close now. To be elected is to be chosen. If you are one of the elect of God, you have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Jesus did say, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And so God is involved in bringing forth his bride out of the human race, and he has a plan and a purpose in the lives of those that he has chosen, and that is your election. You are the election if you're among the chosen, and he has a certain election for you, a certain divine, sovereign will for your life. Now, on the basis of that, let's Let's uh, focus our attention on the closing scriptures that all talk about our response to this revelation of being one of God's elect. How do we respond? How do we live? How do we act? Uh, what kind of expression of gratitude should we send back to God? And that's what these scriptures are all about. First, we walk in obedience. When you realize that God has picked you, selected you as one of his uh, chosen ones, there should be such a response of worshipful awe and appreciation and gratitude that you walk in obedience. And that's what 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 is all about. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Now, if someone has truly been chosen by God, truly been elected by God, and God has poured his grace into your life, there is going to be a heart change. It is unto obedience, as worded in the King James Version, because it, it not only encourages you, to be obedient to God, but it transforms you inwardly, internally, where your passion, your desire, your longing is to be obedient to his demand in your life. And obedience is something we have to learn. The Bible says, Jesus, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And that is a very necessary lesson to be learned in this life. Now, we have been elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and then it said, in sanctification of the Spirit. Uh, the King James Version says, through sanctification of the Spirit. Now, the word sanctification has a double meaning. It means, number one, that you have been set apart unto God for his sacred use. And number two, it can mean being cleansed from the defilement of sin. And so, yes, God has chosen us, but God has chosen us through sanctification of the Spirit, through his divine will and purpose and plan, setting us apart unto a sacred purpose and then cleansing us by the blood of the Lamb so that we have the capacity to walk in obedience. It's all a work of God, and we can't credit ourselves. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Ephesians 2.8, by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So even the faith you exhibit in order to receive the things of God is itself a gift of God to begin with. So it's all to his glory. Next, our second response to divine election in our life. If God has truly chosen us in him and if God has given us a purpose in life that is already mapped out for us, how do we respond? By walking in Christ-like character. That's your next scripture. Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13 says, Therefore, 
as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, ten, put on, put on, watch the words put on. We'll come back to that in a few moments. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also, so you also must do. And so being elect of God is not a ticket to arrogance. Realizing that God has put his finger on your life, that God has touched you with his divine purpose, should not produce in us uh, any kind of uh, haughty religious attitude, but quite the contrary. We, in our response, we put on this nature of Christ. In fact, Galatians 3.27 says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's like uh, when you get up in the morning, you put on the garments that you want to wear to present yourself to the people you're going to meet that day. So also as you go through life, you put on Christ. You respond as he would respond. You talk as he would talk. You do as he would do. In any given circumstance, you're always measuring yourself by that standard. You put on Christ. And then Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22, 23, and 24 says, Put off the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, start thinking in a brand new way. Not thinking, I am a, a self-centered person out to gratify the desires of my flesh and walk over other people in the process. But your new way of thinking is, I am in union with the crucified one, so I present my body as a living sacrifice to be crucified with him. And I am in union with the resurrected one to live in victory over all the adversaries I face in life. So you put off the old man, which is corrupt. You are renewed in the spirit of your mind, and then you make the choice to put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you have a new nature. The moment you're born again, you have a righteous nature, you have a holy nature, and your way of responding to the choosing of God in your life is to actually walk in that holiness and that righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? Colossians 3.14 says, put on love which is the bond of perfectness or the bond of perfection. And the word translated love there is agape, which means the God kind of love, the kind of love that can even be bestowed on enemies. Put on the new man. Put on love. Put on Christ. And finally, Colossians 3.10 also says, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So the new man means that you ideate, you think, you process information with the mind of Christ. You don't see things from an earthly perspective, but from a heavenly one. So many people quote that passage out of Isaiah 55 where God said, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so my thoughts are above your thoughts. But he was talking to unregenerated people when that scripture was given. Now... Through the born-again experience, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And if his thoughts are as high above us as the heaven is above the earth, when we're in the natural, once we are identified with him and seated with him in heavenly places, we can begin to think like God thinks. Because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. And Philippians chapter 2, let this same mind dwell in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So... We put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. And then while we're putting on Christ and putting on the new man, we might as well go ahead, according to the command in Ephesians, and put on the whole armor of God as a response to the choosing of God in our life. It's all about gratitude. It's not about fear. It's not about serving God out of a sense of a fear of reprisal if we don't or fear of consequences if we fail, but it should all be a loving response. Then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, one of my favorite passages says, well, uh, actually, the verse prior to it says, we have received exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. 
So God's given all these promises that enable us to tap into his love, tap into his joy, tap into his peace, tap into his wisdom, because as he is, so are we in this world. Whatever he is has been downloaded into us, and because we have these exceeding great and precious promises, we can partake of the divine nature. And then it says, also for this reason, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue, which is the perfection of moral godly qualities, to virtue knowledge, which means intimate soul knowledge, not just head knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, stick to an attitude of determination. To perseverance add godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness. Now notice brotherly kindness is at the top of the list. And to brotherly kindness, love, agape love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can be chosen, you can be elected, and yet be barren and unfruitful if you do not add virtue to your faith. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, self-control. These are necessary things, or... You clog up your, your spirit. You prevent that ordination, that divine election, from flowing out of you unhindered. If these things be in you and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. How do you make your divine election certain? How do you make it sure? By applying to your life a passion for Christ-like character and going after it. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now, what's the final scripture I've got on this whole subject of divine election and how it involves the predestination of God and also the free will of man? I think there's no better way of ending it than Psalm 139 and uh, the statement, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. In other words, I'm in awe. I'm in awe over the fact that I have been chosen of the creator of the universe. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for the divine choosing, the divine election that has been placed on our life. Now help us to walk in Christ-like character as we put on Christ, as we put on the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us act and react in this world just as he would do in Jesus' name. Amen. Now that was the closing out of the elect of God. Now let's focus our attention on chapter 8 which is our calling to be the fullness of him who fills all in all. And this is a study of two related themes. First, how Jesus, the heavenly bridegroom, brings his everlasting bride to fullness or completion. But mysteriously, how we, the bride, bring him, the bridegroom, to fullness or completion. It is a reciprocal relationship. And the powerful passage we're going to start out with is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. It's talking about the resurrection. And it says uh, the Father, of course, executed the resurrection, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What a tremendous title God has placed upon the body of Christ. Now remember, and there's a progression of revelation in these four verses, 20 through 23 that first Jesus was resurrected out of the grips of death. He conquered all the arch enemies of the human race, the curse of death, the curse of Adam, the curse of sin, the curse of the law, death, hell, and the grave. He rose up above all of these things, put them under his feet. And now if you receive him into your heart, you become part of his mystical body. 
the body of Christ that is united to him by the born-again experience, not by denominational affiliation, not by sprinkling as an infant, but the way you are united to the Lord Jesus Christ is by receiving him into your heart, uh, an acknowledgement that he is Lord over your life. And then you are propelled to this place of dominion, restored dominion, where he becomes head over all things to the church. In other words, this is a headship shared with the church. As he is, so are we in this world. If he has power over all powers and principalities, you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. It's under your feet. If it's under his feet, it's under your feet. If he has dominated sin, you dominate sin. If he has dominated the devil and all his underlings, you are in a place of domination over the devil and all his underlings. So he has shared this headship with you. Why? Because you are the fullness of him who fills all in all. He fills the entire universe, but only in the church, in the bride, is he bringing himself to fullness of expression. The word fullness means the highest state of being or completion. It means the maximum. It means something taken to the utmost extreme or the absolute limit. It is the peak product. So the peak product of God's creative genius is the bride delivered from the muck and the mire of sin. But as Hannah said, God raises up the poor from the dust and the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to inherit the throne of glory. So you go from the lowest place, which is this world and all of its entanglements. This is the most depressed, most dark, most demonically controlled place in the entire universe, surely. And so we are trapped in this hellish place uh, where death is on every side. But then God lifts us up and we inherit the throne of glory. We go from the bottom to the top as he brings us to fullness and as he receives us as his fullness, his completion. Now, the word fullness is first used of Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, it talks about how the firstborn son is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. The firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him, through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So Jesus was the full expression of the nature of the Father to the point where he said, he who has seen me has seen my Father. If you want to see the love of the Father, look at the firstborn Son. If you want to see the joy of the Father expressed, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to see the peace, the calmness, the confidence of God, Look at the Lord Jesus Christ because he was the fullness. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now I want to remind you of a little side issue that he is spoken of as being the head of the body. But remember that a body is incomplete without a head, but in like manner, a head is incomplete without the body. If, uh, if you came upon a person, uh, you were visiting someone, you came in the room and their body was on one side of the room, their head was on the other, you've got a serious problem if there's a severed condition. Well, that's what happened when the whole human race fell. Uh, when Adam and Eve transgressed, the head was severed from the body. No wonder death has reigned in this place. But through what Jesus did, there's been a reuniting. Now, wherever the head is, there the body is also. So if Jesus, the head, is in a position of absolute victory, you and I, the body, are in a place of absolute victory because where the head is, you also find the body. Isn't that fantastic? Now, how was Jesus brought to fullness? Two ways, by the word and by the spirit. Number one, 
He was the Word made flesh. He was the sum total of all the words that God ever has spoken or God ever will speak. It's all contained within Jesus. Not only Genesis through Revelation, the written Word, but the comprised uh, living Word. Uh, uh, the full amount of rhema word expressions that God's given to any person he's been in relationship with from the very beginning to the very end, that's all part of the eternal word. And Jesus was the word made flesh, and he was brought to fullness by the word being expressed in him. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. That's John 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, the Son of God was also brought to fullness or brought to completion when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, the day of his baptism. In John chapter 3, verse 34, it says, He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. In other words, God did not give the Spirit by measure to him. He received the fullness of the Spirit. And so Jesus was brought to fullness by the fullness of the word, the revelation of the mysteries of God, the revelation of the nature of God. All the words of God were contained within him, and all the spirit of God was contained within him. And these two things brought him to fullness. But we are branches on the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And the same life sap that flows through the vine flows through the branches also. We are in that much of a union with him. And so if the vine has fullness, the branches have fullness. Now, what brings us to fullness? The same two things. Number one, we are begotten of the word. And uh, James chapter 1, verse 18, for instance, says, of his own will. Now, this is the King James Version, so it uses some old English. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures or first fruits of all creation. In other words, just like the Jewish people under the old will, especially during the feast, uh, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, they would bring the first fruits of whatever harvest was going on, the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, the fruit harvest. They would bring the first fruits to Jerusalem to be offered to God. And it was a testimony of the cry of their hearts that the blessing of God come on the remaining crop that would yet be harvested. Well, if the church is, uh, if the, church is the firstborn of all creation, which some uh, renderings of this passage say, we are the firstborn of every creature, the firstborn of all creation, then we are the beginning of a redemptive work that will one day envelop the entire universe. We are the start of a harvest where God is harvesting the universe unto himself once again to perfect it, a new heaven and a new earth. But he has begat us or begotten us by the word of truth. What brought you into a relationship with God? Somebody shared the gospel with you. The seed of the word was dropped in your heart and you were begotten in a spiritual sense. Then 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul said, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So once again, he's talking about how the word he preached was a spiritual way of begetting other sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. So we've received the word. We've been begotten of the word, not a part of the word, not a little slice of the word, but the fullness of the word. And then John chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, we've also been born of the spirit. Begotten of the word, the conception takes place, then born of the spirit. And uh, human talk, it takes nine months for, uh, for the, con uh, the, conceived, uh, uh, the conceived child to finally emerge uh, fully developed in the womb. And sometimes when you share the word with people, it doesn't happen overnight. Maybe it takes a while for that to develop in them until they actually have a spiritual rebirth. But it said, Jesus answered Nicodemus, and said, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Then he went on to say, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. So to be born of the spirit, what does that mean? Well, the 
the word used in this same full passage where Jesus said you must be born again is the Greek word anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, that literally means from above. So when Jesus said you're born of the Spirit, just like in the natural, you're born of your mother, you come out of your mother's womb, so you're born of the Spirit. Something comes out of the Holy Spirit into you. And it's a brand new spirit. Ezekiel prophesied in advance, God said, thus saith the Lord, I will put a new spirit in you. And that spirit is created in the image of God so that you become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that spirit is in union with the Holy Spirit and you have the fullness. That's why I do not pray for people to receive double portion anointings because you've received the most that you can possibly receive. You've received the fullness of the word. You've received the fullness of the spirit. You have been born again. You have been begotten of the word. You have been brought to fullness. Now, the purpose, though, of the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to take the potential that is already resident within the hearts of born-again children of God and bring it forth until they're walking in a manifestation of it. And let me give you the scripture, Ephesians 4, verses 11, uh, 12, and 13. This is talking about how Jesus ascended on high and he gave gifts to men, which is actually a quote from Psalm 68, repeated in Ephesians chapter 4. He gave gifts to men, and then it said he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. So uh, these fivefold ministry positions are gifts from God to your life. The person that influences you and impacts you with revelation knowledge is a gift from God into your life to produce a certain end result. Let's find out what it is. They are gifts given by God for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ or the fullness of the Messiah. And so our destiny is to emerge in the fullness of the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing potential you have. You may not see it now. You may not recognize it now. But if I were to show you an acorn, you couldn't see an oak tree. You couldn't see a tree trunk. You couldn't see tree limbs or leaves or hundreds of acorns on the ends of those branches but it's all hidden in the life that is hidden inside of that individual acorn. And hidden inside of you is an awesome potential to emerge completely in the image of Jesus, the firstborn son. And my role as an evangelist, as a teacher, in any kind of apostolic or prophetic flow in my life is to awaken that in your life as well. I love Romans 8, 28 and 29. It says, we know, this is an assurance, a blessed assurance. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, what is his purpose? It says, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestine, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be what? The firstborn among many brethren. He walked in the fullness of the Godhead that was placed within him. God's fullness was in him by the word and by the spirit. Now, in a, a, a related sense, in a qualified sense, you are certainly not God. Uh, you can't take that step of deception that New Agers take when they say we are God. But we have been made heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And that word joint heir means an equal heir. In other words, all that he is and all that he has has been passed to us as an inheritance. That's why all things work together for good to those who love God because the destiny, the purpose is to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that takes good experiences and bad experiences. You can look back into your life and see the most painful parts of your past, but recognize how it produced the Christ-like nature of forgiveness in you, 
how it produced the Christ-like nature of humility in you, how it produced the Christ-like nature of trust in you, how it produced the Christ-like nature of compassion in you. And I could list many other attributes. And it came through this terribly painful thing, maybe even your own personal failures, but you gave it all to God and this genius who has ordered the entire universe takes your life in shambles and puts the puzzle together and makes everything work together for good. If you don't have anything else to shout about, you can shout about that today. Now, I've got some other supportive scriptures that show that we're emerging in the image of this fullness of his nature. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed or transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, the mirror is the word of God. That's what James tells us. Usually any symbol that is found in the Bible, that biblical symbol is explained in another portion of the Bible. And uh, James related to us that if a man looks into the word of God, it's like a man looking into a mirror to see a reflection of his image, what he is supposed to be. Well, when we look in the mirror of the word of God, we see this reflection of the firstborn son. And we see this challenging image of what we are to walk in. We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, but it, we're not on our own in the process because we are transformed from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so this is God's idea, not my idea. I didn't write up this covenant. He wrote the covenant and I agreed to it and I receive all the benefits. Galatians 4.19, though, shows that it's not an easy process, not for you nor for those who lead you. Because Paul said, my little children of whom I travail again in birth until Christ be formed in you. So it's not going to be easy, but it's the only thing worthwhile. It's the only thing worth seeking for in life. Though not fully manifested, being complete or full in Christ is still to be considered a present possession. Now, this is where you call those things that are not as though they were. And that's not living in fantasy. That's living in faith. And there's a, a fine line between faith and presumption. But you don't, for instance, you don't beg God to heal you. As far as heaven's concerned, you're already healed because the scripture says, with his stripes you were healed. And so the correct approach is, God, I lay claim to what is already rightfully mine. You healed me 2,000 years ago when you were striped at a pillar in Pilate's Hall, Lord Jesus. So I lay claim to what's rightfully my possession right now. In fact, the Bible said we've got to possess our possessions. Just like the land of promise belonged to the children of Israel, God ordained them for it and ordained it for them but they still had to go in and fight to obtain, to possess what was already rightfully theirs. And your promised land is made up of 7,487 promises in God's word, but you've got to fight to seize those promises and bring them into manifestation, and you do that by faith. And one way you do it by faith is by confessing and proclaiming these things as if it's a done deal. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 8, you are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I wish you did reign that we also might reign with you. So he's saying, you don't have to beg God for this fullness. You're already full. Anything that you could have had need of, according as his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God's left nothing else. Uh, uh, lacking in your life. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. So dare to say I am full. I do have the fullness of the Godhead within my heart. When I invited the Lord Jesus in, the fullness of the Godhead was within him, and he transfers to me by his spirit and by his word all that he is. Knowing the love of Christ that passes knowledge also opens the door for us to walk in fullness. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 19 says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with his might, strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Now, you need to, you need to see this is not just wishful thinking. 
This is a spirit-inspired intercessory prayer. Yes, on one level, foundationally, this is Paul praying for the Ephesian church. We can look back as if this is a historical thing, that this is a prayer that was uttered almost two millennia ago that God would do this for those people. Or you can bump it up to the higher level of interpretation because nothing in the Bible uh, was there just on a whim. The Bible said holy men of God spoke as they were, wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I would dare to say not only is it a prayer for the Ephesians, it's not only Paul praying for the Ephesian church, it's the Holy Spirit interceding through Paul for the entire church of the new covenant age. And so dare to say I received this intercession. Because the Holy Spirit has never prayed where the Father didn't answer. The Son of God has never prayed where the Father didn't answer. And the Bible did say in Romans chapter 8 that when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit makes intercession for us according to the will of God. Well, here's the Holy Spirit's intercession. All through the New Testament, you find the Holy Spirit inspiring a Bible writer to write an inspired prayer that you and I can receive as if it's a done deal. He said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You ought to say, I received that. I received that divine might, the mightiness of the almighty God, strengthening my spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I received that. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. That when you get a glimpse of the love that God has toward you, it awakens in you this capacity to be filled with all the fullness of God. His joy, his peace, his power, his strength, everything God is, is triggered by this revelation of love. You need to realize God's in love with you. God's head over heels in love with you. Jeremiah 31, 3, he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's an unchanging, undying love. Everlasting means having no beginning and having no ending. God never decided to start loving you. Loving you has always been a part of who God is. And when you realize that you are sheltered by that love and carried in his bosom, perfect love casts out all fear then you can live a fearless life knowing that the Almighty God loves you to that degree. And then there's no hindrance, there's no obstacle. You can be filled with all the fullness of God. How powerful is that? And this is all a part of our inheritance because as I mentioned previously, we are joint heirs with Christ. What he has received, we have received. Now, two other interesting versions of our title scripture, which is Ephesians 1.23, that calls us the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are the fullness. Now, up until now, I've been talking about how he has brought us to fullness. But now let's focus our attention on how we bring him to fullness. And another, uh, uh, another way of interpreting that verse the Jerusalem Bible says we are the fullness of him who fills the whole creation. So he has, uh, he has spanned the entire universe with his presence. But he hasn't expressed his character in stars and comets and planets and mountains and hills and flowers and, and the rest of natural creation. Only in you has he brought forth this fullness. You are the fullness of him who fills the whole creation. But the creation is not his fullness. It doesn't bring him to completion. It's something he fills, but not something that brings him to fullness. And uh, today's English version says we are the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. And so dare to say, I am God's completion. Isn't that difficult to say? It's not hard for me to say God is my completion because I realize how incomplete I was without him. And certainly God could be incomplete, or, or rather God could be complete all by himself without including us in, in, in this equation. But God by his own choosing 
chooses to be incomplete without his bride. He's depicted himself as a bridegroom. A bridegroom is not complete until that bridegroom is united to a bride. Let's, let's explore this idea. All right? This very important passage enables us to see that not only does God bring us to fullness, amazingly, we bring him to fullness as well. Just as Eve completed Adam, God realized that there was something missing in Adam. So he made, the King James Version says, a help meet for him. The modern King James Version says, a helper suitable for him. But that old English word, meet, means fit, worthy, suitable, or sufficient. Fit, worthy, suitable, or sufficient. And so Adam, though he did not recognize it within himself, he did not recognize that he was incomplete, but God said it's not good for man to be alone and realized that he would only be complete if he pulled something out of Adam, separated it from him for a season, a rib, shaped the woman, and then brought them together in a union. So also, we were hidden in Christ. We were hid with Christ in God in the very beginning, and then God brought us out of him. The Spirit comes from God who gave it, to be separated from him for a season, only be, to be reunited with him in order to bring the bridegroom to completion. Now, Proverbs 12, 4 says, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And when the bride of Christ walks in virtue and holiness, the crown speaks of completion and perfection. The crown speaks of fulfillment. And so, in other words, she brings her husband to fullness. She brings her husband to completeness when she walks in virtue. She's a committed, covenant-keeping wife, and she brings her husband to fullness and completion. So it also goes for the body of Christ, for the bride of the Lord Jesus. We are his fullness if we walk in virtue. Now, Ephesians 4.10 says that Jesus ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Ultimately, I believe ultimately he will fill all creation. He will permeate the world with his presence once again so that everything will be ever green and ever living. There will be no wilting flowers. Death will not be found in nature uh, because God will just saturate the whole creation with his presence. But once again, he will only bring forth his fullness in us because we are his fullness. In the kingdom age, God's Shekinah glory will be all pervasive. In fact, the land will be called Beulah according to Isaiah 62 verse 4. And that word Beulah means married. So in a sense, God will marry himself to the mountains, to the trees, to the flowers, to the animals. In a very unique blending of the divine with the, uh, with the natural. A very unique blending of the supernatural with the natural. I do not believe the creation will ever become God but I believe it will be blended with God so that all things are brought to perfection. No wonder Romans 8, 21 says that the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And then Ephesians chapter 1 Verses 9 and 10 says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in us himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, see, even time has a fullness, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together into one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And so there's a certain point in the progression, in the evolution of God's plan, where every redeemable thing will be redeemed that does not include Satan, nor does it include those who rebel against the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so this is not uh, a, a universalistic doctrine. But all redeemable things will be brought back into fullness of expression and brought into oneness with God in the dispensation of the fullness of times. As we near the finale, as we near the completion of this age, some other things are going to be brought to fullness. And even though we've, uh, we've covered the revelation of what it is to be the fullness of him who fills all, I just want you to see, as a word study, some of the other things that will be brought to fullness as this age comes to a close. First of all, in Daniel 8, verse 23, 
It talks about evil abounding in the last days. And it says in the latter time of their kingdom, talking about those who are allies of the Antichrist, allies of the beast. It says in the latter time of their kingdom, when transgressors have come to the full, a king fierce of face and skilled at intrigues shall stand up. And it's a description of the Antichrist. So transgression will come to the full. Can't you see that building up in the world right now? Woe to them that call evil good and call good evil. And we see this amazing deception cloaking the minds of the human race now where people that stand up for virtue and righteous and morality are the bad ones. And people who stand for vice and perversion are the good ones because they're loving and kind, it seems, and tolerant. And so they've mixed this thing up that love is not really understood anymore and it's part of the deception of the last days. So transgression is going to come to the full. In Matthew 24, verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever reads, let him understand, then you know uh, when that, uh, des when that uh, greatest sin of all takes place. It's called the abomination of desolation or the, the most full and complete rebellion against God ever to manifest in this world. What's that going to be? The abomination that makes desolate, that will bring desolation on this planet, is when Satan will be manifested in a human body, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the antichrist, He's been given many names in Scripture, but he will become a vessel completely possessed by Satan, and the people will call him God. The mystery of godliness was that God was manifested in the flesh, and the people called him the devil. The mystery of iniquity, Paul calls it in his letter to the Thessalonians, the mystery of iniquity is that Satan will be manifested in the flesh, seated on a throne in the restored temple in Jerusalem and the people will hallow him as God. And that will bring final desolation on this planet. We're not far from that coming to pass. Also, the great horror of the book of Revelation, which I believe represents the corrupt economic, political, religious systems that rule the world. All of them are Babylon. All of them stream from Babel in the beginning that uh, brought the judgment of God upon itself through disobedience. But the uh, great whore of the book of Revelation is going to have a golden cup in her hands full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And that's when great judgment will come on all of these world systems that have been antichrist in nature called the great whore, mystery Babylon. And the word Babylon coming from the word Babel means confusion. It's the switching of opposites. It's the deception of this world. And right there in Revelation 17, verse 4, it says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and she was gilded with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, not married to God and bringing forth the truth, but married to a world system and married to a satanic influence that causes everything opposite to the truth. Now, the fullness of the Gentiles will also come in in our era. Let's read Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So, part of what God is doing in the last days is phasing out the era where there's going to be a great harvest among the Gentile nations and shifting his attention back to Israel. And it's already happening. It's going to be a very slow phase, I believe. I don't think uh, at any uh, soon moment in the future God's going to suddenly cut off from the Gentile world, but there's going to be a transfer of heaven's attention where suddenly God's going to do some enormously powerful things in Israel as uh, we ready ourselves for the coming of the Lord. And I do believe that the fullness of the Gentile age is coming to a close sometime in the future. Only God knows. It could be 10 years, 20 years. We don't know for sure, but we do know that the fullness will come in. 
And then Romans 11, verses 12 and 15 says, Now, if their fall, if the fall of Israel is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? And so if the door was flung open wide to the Gentile world by the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus by the majority of Jews in his day, and that became the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So truth is going to run parallel. And when God begins to move, and he's already moving in phenomenal ways, Messianic Jews fill the land of Israel. similar great move of God in the Gentile portion of the church worldwide. For if they're being cast away as the reconciling of the world, what will the receiving of them be or the accepting of them be but life from the dead? And so that means we're coming right up to the edge of the resurrection of the dead, which will happen at the last day of this age, uh, not seven years prior, but the resurrection takes place the last day of this age. Uh, after the Antichrist is manifested, the Bible says in 2 uh, Thessalonians, uh, let no man deceive you by any means that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship. And so the, the catching away of the saints cannot take place until the Antichrist is revealed. The abomination of desolation takes place. We're brought to the end of the age and life from the dead happens. In God's presence, we experience fullness of joy when the earth will be the Lord's in its fullness because Psalm 16, 11 says, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. So let's lay hold to that one. Let's live in the presence of God and live in the joy of the Lord and just defy depression and discouragement and all the things that seek to rob us of this inheritance. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. To be at the right hand of God is to be a trusted person that he shares his authority with, that he shares his mysteries with, to be the means by which he accomplishes his purposes in this world. Then Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and its fullness. And one day that will fully come to pass, the world and those who dwell therein. When these things happen, we will realize more than ever that we are truly his fullness. When all of these things reach a peak of fullness, then the fullness of God's purpose in us will be birthed into being as the bride becomes the kingdom government that will be installed worldwide as this planet is inundated with the glory of God. The Bible said that the, uh, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. When the world is brought to this full paradise state again, we as the bride in the fullness of all her glory will rule and reign with him as we see this world restored to what God wanted it to be in the very beginning. So the future is bright. Let's walk that direction, shouting and realizing not only has God brought me to fullness by his own choosing, you and I and the rest of the body of Christ have brought him to fullness. And he delights himself to be completed by his earthborn bride. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this revelation. Thank you for the awesomeness of what it is to be elected of God, to have a divine election, to respond to that gratefully with worship in our lives, applying the nature of Christ to our lives. And let us walk in this mindset that we are full. We have everything we need. We have no lack. We can confess and declare what already rightfully belongs to us as the fullness of him who fills all in all. In Jesus' name, amen. Hasn't this been a great session? I hope it has changed your thinking for the rest of your life.